Okay. Jane, first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to do all the stuff that you've agreed to do, because we've kept you pretty busy. Um, and I think a good place to start, why don't you tell us a little, uh, a little bit about your dress? Okay, well, this was as accurate a version of the original dress as we could come up with. <laughs> as accurate as we could come up with, Jean-Pierre Doliac uh, did the original, and apparently still has it. Might be wearing it. <laughs> but, um, but Sherry Ingle, who is here somewhere, Sherry, turn around and take a bow. She is the one who designed all the costumes on Dr. Quinn, did almost every movie I've ever done, has been nominated uh, for uh, best costuming and everything, and has been working with me with the art to wear, that you've seen and lots, countless other things that I've done in the design world. And uh, she is the one who uh, figured out how to make this dress. And uh, it's beautiful. Thanks. Oh, and uh, Jo Addy, uh, every year she lets me borrow this special jewelry. Thank you, Jo. Oh, and Dee, oh my God, you cannot wear this dress without this particular hairstyle. And this is, this is her Gibson Extraordinaire. I think this is the best one she's ever done. Um, it's amazing. And, and it's actually comfortable. I can, do you see the back? Look at that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Dee, you're a genius. Where are you, Dee? There's Dee. Oh, she's, she's not there. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a couple questions about somewhere in time, and... Mobility? <laughs> Here's my first question about the movie. What do you think might have been different if there hadn't been an actor strike and you actually had been able to promote the movie? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I, I think, um, you know, it, it would have maybe gotten a release. <laughs> Uh, was it released anywhere other than here at the Grand Hotel? I don't think so. Um, you know, I think, you know, people were wondering what uh, Chris Reeve was going to do after Superman, and this is what he did. And I think some people thought that this was not worthy of his, uh, you know, stature in the movie industry at that time. But this is the movie he loved more than anything. And... Um, I think if it had some publicity, I think it would have certainly have helped. But, you know, it's an acquired taste. This is an audience movie rather than a critic's movie. So maybe it did the right thing. Okay, the next thing I want to ask you about the movie, um, I think everybody knows this movie was shot on two different film stocks when they were back in 1912. It was shot on uh, Fujifilm because it was a little softer, it was a little more pastel, and it looked like that era. What's your favorite scene in the movie that was you know, representative of 1912? I think that promenade, the one that looked like a Soro painting, was kind of beautiful, where we're walking around and there's no, no dialogue. I thought that was absolutely beautiful. Um, because I remember, as you know, when we first started showing us um, Impressionist paintings in a book, and said, this is what it looks like when we go back in time. I mean, obviously there are you know, scenes that I love that were more important, but there was something very beautiful about that montage. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to ask you, and this is one of the things that doesn't get explored that much. Um, explain what your connection was to John Barry and how you got him involved with the movie. So I knew John Barry back, oh, back in the day when I was a very young actress. Um, I think it was before I even did the Bond film, or it was certainly around that, so early 20s, or even 19. I just, I met him socially, and um, he was known as a bit of a bad boy. And uh, I think at that time he'd had a relationship with Jane Birkin, or something. Anyway, well, I knew as my agent said, if you ever go out with John Barry, I will not represent you. So <laughs> that made him interesting immediately. <laughs> um, however, I was smart enough never to go out with John Barry. He became a very close friend. 
he then married um, a wonderful woman called Laurie, who he was married to forever. Laurie Barry um, was, is 10 years younger than me, much younger than John. And she dedicated her life to helping him in areas and ways that he was not as adept at. She really gave him the space to become this incredible um, compo composer, which he was. So um, Laurie and I were friends, and I made this movie, and I said, Laurie, I have just made a movie that is screaming for a John Barry score. I said, but they don't have money for anything, let alone a John Barry score. And um, she took a look at it and she said, oh my gosh, John has to do this. So she took it to John and John went, you're right, I do have to do this. I love this movie. I really want, to, and I know exactly what I want to do with it. And he got very excited, but he also realized that he would not get paid. So he made a deal he never made before or since, which was a back-end deal where he got paid nothing up front. And, um, but he owned you know, a large part of it on what they call the back-end when it would be sold. And uh, my now very ex-husband was his business manager. That eventually happened in life. And he told me that at one point, when they were hard-pressed for money, the music from the soundtrack of Summer in Time was hugely beneficial to them. And, um, and to this day, I, you know, I think it's, it's uh, you know, very important to their family. And um, you know, I remember John playing it to me, I think over the telephone, uh, he let me listen to it when it was being recorded, and I just had tears in my eyes. And he loved this movie, and he loved the music he did in it, and it ended up being one of his great successes. Jane, you've been interviewed a bunch of times about Summer in Time. So here's my question. Of all of the questions you've been asked, what's the one question you haven't been asked about Somewhere in Time? Well, that would be very hard. I don't really know. Um, somebody told me in town that, uh, that every night I used to go, go and get drunk in a bar <laughs> with Christopher Reeve. No, no, that didn't happen. <laughs> so I know some of the anecdotes that aren't true, but um, one of the things they, they didn't ask me, um, well, I think, you know, the famous, um, you know, the scene in this dress when I declared my love to Chris, um, I did it directly to him. And of course, they had his coverage, and then they came around to do my coverage. And uh, for reasons that I don't exactly remember, they hadn't got what the, the main shot, which was the close-up. And they didn't need Chris for that because he was off camera. Uh, so they needed someone for me to look at. Normally, they just give you a little you know, a piece of sticky tape in green or red and say, that's... The guy. I'm like, <laughs> this time they gave me Richard Matheson himself. And he sat there and he looked at me. And I remember doing it maybe in one or two takes. I didn't do very many takes. It, it, just, it was just there. And it happened. And I did it to him. And the story goes that when I finished doing it, he was so moved that he felt that his love for his wife was such that he should leave the room immediately. <laughs> and he went home. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> here's my next question. We're going to shift gears just a little bit. You have been so gracious, and you gave us so much of your time, and I know that tomorrow you're taking off where are you headed tomorrow when you leave? Um, I am going to Dublin. And I am uh, shooting, immediately shooting, uh, two days on a Netflix movie playing Lindsay Lohan's mother. <laughs> you like Lindsay? Well, she's making a comeback. She just did a Christmas movie that I think is coming out. And the same people are doing this movie. It's called An Irish Wish. And um, mostly I'm on the telephone. I'm, I'm hoping I get to meet Lindsay. I'm told she's doing a little green screen at the end of the second day, but this is their last day of that movie. Anyway, I'm just fitting that in. Why I'm really in Dublin is I'm starring in Harry Wilde. Has anyone seen Harry? A few people. 
Well, Harry Wilde uh, is considered by people I know who've seen a lot of my work as being one of the best things I've ever done. Um, I am incredibly proud of it. It's on Acorn. You say, where is Acorn? Um, you go to Amazon Prime or someone like that, and I think the first month is free, and then after it's about $5 a month, so it's not that expensive. You will see the best, the best television uh, you can imagine from England and Ireland and Scotland and um, New Zealand and uh, Australia. It's really amazing. But this particular piece was written for me um, and uh, by a man called Dave Logan. And it's just, it, it's marvelous. I mean, if I kind of explain who the character is, I mean, one person here came up to me and said, are you really that person? I went, no, I'm playing it. <laughs> But uh, there are elements of Harry that are definitely me. So Harry is a retired, she retires in the first episode as an English literature professor at Dublin University. She's been doing that her whole life. She has a son who's a detective, criminal detective, who's married and has a, uh, she has a grandchild. And um, I, he, he has very little time for his mother. Um, she retires and then goes down to the pub and drinks a lot of shots and decides to you know, have a way with that man, just for no reason. Um, that's, you know, she's, she's, but she, what happens is she, um, she gets mugged and has to stay with her son and he is trying to solve a crime and she realizes when she's really bored to tears because his literature in his house is a lot to be desired. So she starts reading his case notes and looks on the TV and goes, wait a minute, I know, I know what this crime is. And so basically, the premise of the story is that she uses her knowledge of literature and history to, um, to find the criminals. And uh, each episode is, is more bizarre than the next. Um, her son and uh, his lot at, at the, the guard, as you call them, the police, off, police force, are furious that his mother is getting involved. And um, the young kid that had um, accidentally you know, grabbed my purse and caused me to you know, be mugged, slight, slightly mugged, and nothing very dangerous, a little scratch, really, basically, uh, ends up becoming my sidekick. And he's brilliant. He's played by a young uh, English guy called Rohan Ned. Uh, he's in, life, in real life, he's 26, but he plays 15. And uh, because I know nothing about the street, and he knows everything about the street, and I find myself using his um, um, sort of expertise to help solving crimes. We become a detective agency together. And I, meanwhile, even in dire circumstances, am teaching him uh, proper grammar. <laughs> and, uh, and, and even people who are about to kill us, I teach them proper grammar, like <laughs> hanged, not hung, hung, not hanged, pictures are hung, people are hanged, which stuff is silly. And it's very comedic. And I'm also teaching him um, sort of Wuthering Heights and Shakespeare and a few other things in between. So it's a very intelligent, comedic, um, who done it? And a great character. And I'm going off now. We did eight. It was the number one show. And now they're bringing me back to do 12 more, which is probably going to be two seasons. Wow. Okay. So, as a segue, because you're telling us where you're going, you told us a little bit about Harry Wilde. How'd you get involved with Harry Wilde? How did it get brought to your attention? It was just offered to me uh, through my agent. I read it and I went, wow, this is really good. Like, really good. And um, I met Dave Logan. And, um, I, you know, I, I had a glass of red wine with him in a, a bar in London. And about three hours later, he knew how to write Harry Wilde. I became Harry Wilde. And I think we finished the bottle. <laughs> Hence the red wine. I don't smoke in Harry Wilde. Occasionally, we tried that. I was supposed to be a chain smoker, but I don't, I don't do smoking at all. So, in fact, I try not to, but it's, it's, I just don't like smoking. Um, so that's one of the characters. But uh, um, that's how it came to me. And, and then I asked them afterwards. I said, who else were you speaking to? And they said, you were our number one choice. So... Um, I was there dream casting, and I said yes. Um, so that, that's what happened there. I, by the way, I've also just finished um, something you can see very soon. Uh, on November 27th, I did something called A Christmas Spark for Lifetime with Joe Lando. So if anyone's a Dr. Quinn fan, you'll love this. 
Um, it's great. They're all excited about it. They've been having me do uh, endless promos. It's going to be a really big thing. It's, it's their big uh, show for Lifetime for Christmas. And um, they never have leading ladies in their 70s, ever. You know, 30 is kind of the cutoff age, usually. So, so I, I am cornering uh, the, a new market. And uh, <laughs> I, I was invited by um, the company AMC, who has everything. I don't know, National Geographic, Discovery, I don't know, any, I mean, a lot, a lot of different networks, including um, Acorn. And, um, and they wanted me to speak to their, you know, people that work in all these different, it's an, an industry thing, not, not, and there were no other actresses there. And they were talking about diversity and, you know, how they're being more inclusive of all different cultures and people, who, you know, who look different, it's, you know, and that was really important. And, and it is, and it's fantastic. And I see it in everything I do, in front of the camera, behind the camera, everywhere. And I said, well, then how did I get a job? And they went, oh, you ticked the box. I said, what box? <laughs> Old. <laughs> I said, yes, I will take that box. And then it occurred to me that other old people uh, either don't want to act anymore, can't remember the lines, or aren't here, sadly. So um, I'm going for old. <laughs> okay, as a segue out of that, I don't know which ones you want to talk about, but I know you have several projects coming up. Yeah. What would you like to talk about? Well, I, I just sort of start talking about some of them. I, I suppose I'll talk about uh, the one, the Christmas Spark one, because it's, that's coming out soon. Um, so, uh, I have to remember now what happened in it. Oh, this is a woman whose um, husband had passed two years before. She hasn't been able to really move on in her life because her, the love of her husband was just so great and they had such an amazing marriage. And she spent a lot of her time looking after him, nursing him through Parkinson's. And um, she's just, you know, she's just stuck to tradition. Everything she does, everything exactly the same way. And she's hanging on to tradition, especially Christmas, because this is what she knows. And then uh, her daughter, you know, tells her that they can't come for Christmas, so she has to go to them, which she's not happy about. But she goes there, ends up um, being asked to direct the, um, the little town's play, and in doing that, keeps bumping into and then meeting and then casting the Joe Lando character, who's a guy who's been a, an explorer and a, you know, a, a, a photojournalist and, um, and a reporter and had traveled the world. And, and the way they meet is that her husband had always said, one day I will take you to the pyramids. And he had been all over the world and now he's settling down. And so it's all about about whether she trusts herself to or dares to or feels it's appropriate to have another relationship at this time in her life. And how does that work? And, you know, does it make any sense? And her daughter saying, Mom, you know, your heart is large enough to have two people. You don't take away the love you have of the one that you loved your whole life that you lost. That love is in your heart forever. And the heart is large enough to, to put in a different uh, form of love. So that's kind of um, the piece. I think you'll love it. It's really fun. And what else do I have? Oh, I did another movie for BuzzFeed about puppies. Uh, they it was. I don't. They haven't announced it yet, although I've already shot it. Um, but uh, they haven't decided what they're going to call it yet. But it, really, really cute love story. This is all about very young people. And again, I'm playing a mother of. Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember who I'm the mother of this time. Uh, <laughs> I should remember, my brain's gone. Uh, but I've been having fun doing a lot of comedy recently. So I really enjoy comedy, but I think I like comedy when it's really grounded in reality. The Kaminsky Method I did, um, that was a wonderful, thank you. I, that was such a great series. And, um, and then uh, Chuck uh, Laurie uh, had me do a, one amazing little speech in uh, the third series, and then that was the end of that. Then he brought me in to do the single Be Positive, which I think some people here have seen. Um, and that was a bizarre character. I was playing an 85-year-old woman who thought she was a rock chick, and she was definitely, definitely the go-to woman in uh, this old people's home. Uh, definitely not me. I mean, it was a very bizarre character and so much fun. Um, but a really good friend of mine, uh, actually, he's the chairman of our board on the Open Hearts Foundation, Tim Mallard, runs four um, homes for, um, you know, for people in Dallas. 
And he said, oh my God, she said, this character Beth exists. She said, in a certain time of night, she said, you know, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of movement in the house. And the bets of this world are on the prowl. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask you a question just to change it up a little bit. Taking Somewhere in Time out of the mix, what's the favorite, your favorite movie that you've been in? <sighs> movie or television? Or, yeah, oh, TV. Or tele you know, it's, it's such a hard question, I'm always being asked it. And uh, sometimes I forget how good some of the things I did in the past were. I mean, I can put a, a list of some of the favorites for various reasons. I mean, War and Remembrance was incredibly hard to do but I was on that for nine months with Sir John Gielgud, and my mother had survived a camp in World War II, and my father had opened the gates of Bergen-Belsen and lost some cousins. So for me, it was um, like a pilgrimage in which I got to um, be that, you know, someone who went through what my family knew about, and, um, and surrounded by actual survivors in actual Auschwitz and Birkenau and Paris and where that happens. So that's something I'll never forget. Was it fun? No. Was it incredibly meaningful? And I have never been able to shake, shake that experience off completely. Yes, so it was very important to me. I would say um, Scarlet Pimpernel was a favorite. Um, interestingly enough, uh, they wanted... Um, um, oh gosh, it's uh, Anthony Andrews and uh, Ian McKellen. And they wanted Ian McKellen to be um, the Scarlet Pimpernel, but they said they didn't know who he was. He wasn't a name. <laughs> Can you believe that? So they gave the role to Anthony Andrews. And then they said, with great excitement, they said, oh, by the way, um, Ian McKellen's going to play Chauvelin, the other character. So, and of course, I did uh, the original Amadeus on Broadway, um, playing opposite to Ian McKellen, and we won all the Tonys, and that was very exciting. Um, what other? Uh, East of Eden, I think, was very powerful. Um, I did a great one that I'm sure you've never seen, but I highly encourage. It's called Enslavement, the Fanny Kemble story. Um, that's a true story about um, a woman who was, like Maud Adams, was the most famous actress of the, in Britain at the time. Uh, she was the star of the Kemble acting family. Um, they were running the Old Vic. They'd run out of money, so they did a, an American tour, came to Philadelphia with their star, which was my character, Fanny. And while Fanny was there and doing all the, all the Shakespeare's, all the classics, um, she fell in love with um, a man in Philadelphia who um, was called Mr. Butler, and he owned Butler Plantations. And um, basically, long story short, he was a major slave owner, probably one of the biggest. And uh, she went back to the plantations, was so appalled by what she saw, uh, tried to help the slaves escape, and eventually was whipped herself on her husband, you know, had her tied up and whipped by by um, one of the, the people there. Anyway, basically she ended up escaping and had to, went back to England and wrote a book called Life on a Plantation. And because of the publication of that book, the British did not support the South in the Civil War. This is a story that is never told in America. We told it, but nobody kind of realized. But if you go to Canada or England or anywhere, you mentioned Fanny Kemble, they know who Fanny Kemble was and they know about, about this story. But the Americans didn't really know about it. So that was a very important one. I also played uh, Hazel Brandon Smith. Uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize. She was the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for fighting racism in the South. Uh, that's where I met Sherry. And, um, but there's a lot of really good things in there that you probably never heard of that I think this audience would love. And I'd put those on the list. Okay. All right. So I'm going to shift gears again. You have some merchandise on sale at the hotel this weekend. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? 
Well, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing some <laughs> gloriously, <laughs> look, I'm seeing people wearing beautiful scarves and hats and, and it's so exciting. Um, I'm an artist and, and one of my passions I've always had is um, I always painted and drew. I also collected fabrics and I'm a scarfaholic and a hataholic actually. I, I have more hats and scarves. I, I have handbags, but that's not my thing. Shoes, yes, I like shoes. Not as much my thing, but hats and, and, and shawls and fabrics. And of course, I love, I love to paint. So I always dreamt of what would it be like if I could make my own fabrics? What it would be like if I could make art to wear? Because I've designed um, clothing for a clothing line before. And the problem with it always is that it doesn't fit somebody exactly right. Whereas if you have a scarf, you could put it on jeans, you could put it on a little black dress, you could put it on anything you want. It will always fit. You can wear it, you know, in a very kind of big sort of like shawl way or you can tie it up and make it into a lovely little scarf. And I got very excited. Uh, Sherry and I decided we were going to try and do this ourselves. And we didn't do it with any store. We only did it online. We started a little online store called janeseymour.com where you can go and, and access them and buy them directly. And my son packages them up with miso and takes them to this. <laughs> Eventually, you get them, apparently. Um, but we had this amazing opportunity to come and do this here at the Grand Hotel. And so we talked to them and said, how would you like us to design something exactly for the hotel? So we had this inspiration with, of course, the geraniums, which are everywhere, and uh, the lilac festival. And so we came up with those designs. And uh, they loved them so much, they decided to carry a few and see how they went. Then they needed more. Then they needed more. And, and I think today we sold out of a bunch of them. Um, but all I can say is we don't make very many. We, they're very collectible. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. And one of them has a cashmere and modal. Mostly they're in modal, an incredible fabric. Um, and you can you know hand wash them and lay them out. And they make great gifts. and. Uh, uh, I'm very proud of them, and, and the hats um, I did with Wallaroo is Stephanie Carter, who's here. Um, that's her company. She came to see what was going to happen. We launched the hats here at the Grand Hotel yesterday. So you who are wearing the hats, you're the first. You're the first. And, uh, and that hat is called the Elise, after Elise McKenna. I wanted a hat that spoke to the era of the Edwardian age, but wasn't costumey. So it's something you could wear today and be chic and cool and hip, and at the same time, um, it protects you from the sun and, um, and it, it speaks to the Edwardian age. That's great. That deserves a round of applause. Oh, I, what I forgot to say is the most important thing is we also have a silent auction and a lot of everything we're doing, we're supporting um, the Open Hearts Foundation, um, which if you don't know much about it, um, you can check it out at the little table there and we can tell you all about it. But um, we've been doing it for, I think, 11 or 12 years, 12 years. Um, and uh, we benefited, I think, this year, 23 different charities. Um, it, it's an extraordinary foundation. We have an amazing board, and uh, Trina, who is here, Trina Pitch, she um, runs the, um, there were 50, so you stand up so people can see who you are. But um, we're doing amazing things. You know, the very big charities are really run like big corporations with a lot of people. Uh, we are, um, what we do is we find people uh, that have been through a challenge in life and taken the opportunity to help others through philanthropy afterwards. And we also have a major uh, volunteering um, side to it too. So we, we really show, curate for people how they can give back, whether it's through volunteering or donations. Great. Okay, so one last question about Somewhere in Time. What's the most amazing or remarkable or memorable thing that's happened to you after the movie was released and it started to gain some traction. What's the one thing that stands out in your mind that really got your attention about how this movie had caught on with people? Well, I, a great friend of mine who was in the film industry but lived in Hong Kong uh, called me one day and said, do you realize how famous you are in Hong Kong? And I went, Hong Kong, I've never been there. And he said, oh no, you should come. So I was invited, I came out to Hong Kong and I wanted to go shopping. 
And the owner of the store came up to me and said, you have to leave now. And I went, why? And they said, have you noticed that every salesperson has left their, <laughs> their area <laughs> and are crowding you? He said, your, your film is the most successful film in the history of Hong Kong. It played for over a year to packed houses. And um, I think it, it Gone with the Wind was the only thing that ever came close. And uh, so Run Run Shaw, who owned and ran all those theaters, asked to meet with me. And he said, why, why you? Why this? You know? And uh, for some reason, it really caught on there. Then um, wherever I would go in the world, if there was a Chinese restaurant, they would play the theme <laughs> from the minute I walk in until I left. <laughs> then I went to the Macau Trotting Club, and I thought I was one of the Beatles. I had, you know, 15 armed bodyguards, and I was still being, you know, moved from side to side. You know those images you see of the Beatles being like, like in, in, in an ocean? It's a scary place to be. I, I, it was unbelievable. I mean, I thought that, you know, being a Bond girl was going to be a big thing, but somewhere in time um, made, you know, made people much more excited, believe it or not. And, um, and it doesn't matter, you know, where I go. I, people either know me for Elise McKenna or Michaela Quinn, or solitaire. Except for the younger generation, they know me as Kitty Cat. <laughs> and I am actually very proud of that, you know, X-rated movie, whatever it is, uh, uh, Wedding Crashes. And I wasn't going to do it at, at, at first because I thought, oh, the Dr. Finn, Quinn fans will have, you know, apoplexy or whatever it's called. You know, they'll, they'll die of a faint to be from watching this thing. And then I thought, well, they can actually choose not to watch it, so that's fine. And then I did it, and uh, it was um, a big game changer for me, career-wise, because uh, people in the industry suddenly went, oh my God, she's funny. <laughs> I mean, I knew I was funny, but... <laughs> they thought I was very, you know, serious and, and could only play virgins uh, until I was 40. <laughs> I was still playing a virgin on Dr. Quinn when I was, what, 45? Something like that. <laughs> yeah. And that was when I thought, well, maybe I'll just, you know, have another baby. And I had twins. <laughs> Don't do it at 45, trust me. <laughs> Jane, thank you so much for being here. <laughs>